If you find these videos helpful, you can come and support us on Patreon. You can gain access to ad-free content, as well as more tests. Your support is appreciated. This part of the test will measure your ability to understand academic passages in English. You can take notes while reading, and you will be able to answer the questions in any order you want. You can skip a question and then return to it later. Most of the questions are worth one point, but the last question in each passage will be worth more than one point.
This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. An image is transferred from one surface to another using a matrix, such as a wood block, metal plate, or stencil in the ancient art of printmaking. Relief, intaglio, lithography, and screen printing are the four basic techniques commonly used to describe the procedure. The oldest of these, relief printmaking, developed in the East and was introduced to Europe during the 15th century. This method involves carving an image into a surface, inking the elevated portions, and printing the result. During the 19th century, Japanese me movement, woodblock printing, a type of relief printmaking, was particularly well liked in Japan and had an impact on numerous European artists. On the other hand, intaglio entails cutting an image into a surface and inking the recesses. This approach is renowned for its depth and detail. This method was expertly applied by Rembrandt, a prominent figure in the Dutch Golden Age in his engravings. A grease substance is used to create an image onto a stone or metal plate in the late 18th century printing process, known as lithography which is followed by the application of water and ink. When pressure is applied, the ink only sticks to the image, producing a print. During the 19th century, the invention of lithography made it possible for art to be widely disseminated in a manner democratizing art. The most contemporary method screen printing makes use of a stencil and a mesh screen. Ink is driven onto the printing surface through the mesh. Artists like Andy Warhol use this technique frequently during the 20th century, reflecting the fusion of high art and common culture. It is impossible to exaggerate the impact of printmaking on both the art world and society at large. Printmaking has played a crucial role in communication and expression throughout history. From the spread of religious and political ideas in early Europe to the development of pop culture today, I frequently assert that printmaking is the voice that reaches all corners of the globe via art. Let's not forget that not all image transfer techniques are regarded as printing. For instance, typical printmaking processes such as photocopying and digital printing lack the depth, texture, and artistic intervention that are essential to these processes. A field that is constantly changing, Printmaking honors its historical foundations while embracing contemporary developments. It combines the past, present, and future in an original way. What is the main idea of a lecture? Who is a well-known artist that utilized the intaglio technique? How does the professor feel about digital printing and photocopying?
What does the professor mean when they say? Printmaking is the voice that reaches all corners of the globe via art. What does the professor imply when they discuss Andy Warhol's use of screen printing? Which of the following are considered traditional printmaking techniques, and which are not? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I'm doing research for my history class, and I'm unsure how to navigate through the archival collections. Sure, I can help with that. The archival collections are a vast reservoir of primary resources. You can search for documents, photographs, maps, and more. That sounds a bit overwhelming. I'm not even sure what I'm looking for. No worries. First, you'll need to refine your research topic to a specific question. Then the search process will become a lot easier. Okay, I'm researching the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Great. You can use our online database to search by topic, date, or location. It also has a section for special collections related to the civil rights movement. What about accessing these documents? Are there any restrictions? Well, most of our archives are open for public access. However, for some of the more delicate or rare items, you may need to request special permission. I see. This seems like a lot of work just to access materials. Yes, it can seem that way, but remember, these tools are designed to preserve history and make it accessible. It's a privilege to have access to them. I hadn't thought of it like that. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Remember, learning how to navigate these resources is a valuable skill. It's like learning to fish instead of just getting a fish. What is the main idea of the dialogue? What does the librarian imply when he says? It's like learning to fish instead of just getting a fish. How does the librarian likely feel about the student's comment that using archival collections seems like a lot of work?
According to the dialogue, what does the student need to do to find specific resources in the archival collections? What does the librarian suggest is the value of learning to use archival collections and databases? Now listen to the lecture. The fascinating world of the Calibri, or as you might know it, the hummingbird, will be explored by us today. The Calibri is an amazing species with a wealth of biological marvels. The hummingbird is unique among birds in that it is the only one with the capacity to hover and fly backward. Their wing structure, which, in contrast to those of other birds, enables their wings to rotate in a full circle facilitates this special ability. The humming sound for which they are known is produced by the swift wing movement, which can reach up to 80 beats per second. The Calibri has the highest metabolic rate of any homeothermic species, making it unmatched from a physiological standpoint. These birds eat up to half their body weight in nectar each day to support their high metabolic rates. They have developed a sharp memory and spatial recall remembering the location of each bloom and how long it takes to rehydrate after feeding, in order to locate the energy-rich nectar. Notably, they have a big advantage over many predators due to their small size and high flight speed. Calibri's high surface-to-volume ratio makes them vulnerable to temperature changes. Therefore, these benefits come at a cost. To conserve energy, they have developed a special mechanism called torpor, in which they drop their body temperature and metabolic rate at night when it's chilly. The bright plumage of the Calibri is a wonder of nature. What we mistakenly think of as iridescence is actually a structural color where the structure of the feathers interferes with light. It's interesting to note that this coloring is important for species identification as well as for enticing mates. In conclusion, the adaptability and diversity of life are demonstrated by the biology of the Calibri. It serves as a reminder that life endures and constantly tests the limits of possibility in order to survive and flourish. What is the main idea of the lecture? According to the lecture, what is the purpose of the Calibri's vibrant plumage? How does the professor feel about the adaptability and diversity of life as demonstrated by Colibri?
What does the professor mean when they say? Life endures and constantly tests the limits of possibility in order to survive and flourish. What is the professor implying when discussing the Calibri's high surface area to volume ratio? Why does the professor mention the Calibri's strong memory and spatial recognition in relation to its feeding habits? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, Professor Jones. I've been thinking about my independent study project for this semester. Ah, yes. What did you have in mind? I was thinking about exploring the impact of artificial intelligence on the job market. That's an excellent topic. However, remember, it's a broad area. How do you plan to focus your research? I plan to concentrate on the displacement of jobs in the manufacturing sector due to the rise of AI technologies. Interesting. It's crucial to note, though, the positive aspects of AI and job creation are often overlooked. I see. So you suggest I should also consider the jobs AI might create? Absolutely. It will provide a balanced view of the situation. That sounds fair. I was worried it might be too much, but I see your point. In academia, we strive for comprehensive understanding. Take your time to explore different perspectives. I will, Professor. Thank you for your guidance. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to your findings. What is the main idea of the dialogue? What does the professor imply when she says? It's crucial to note, though, the positive aspects of AI and job creation are often overlooked. How does the student feel about the professor's suggestion to explore the jobs AI might create?
What is the professor's attitude when the student expresses concern about the scope of the project? What is the professor's final remark about the student's independent study? Now listen to the lecture. An important aspect of our faces is our brow. They provide crucial biological tasks and are not only an aesthetic quality. First and foremost, our eyebrows shield our eyes from sweat, rain, and other foreign objects. They keep our eyes clear and focused by acting as a small umbrella or shield. Additionally, eyebrows are very important for communication and facial identification. When the rest of the face is hidden, research from the University of Lethbridge in Canada discovered that we can recognize one another substantially more reliably by our brows than by our eyes. Additionally important for conveying moods are the brows. They play a crucial role in our nonverbal communication, whether they are lifted in astonishment or wrinkled in worry. However, brows have more purposes than only signaling and defending oneself. Through the ages, they have had and continue to have cultural and fashion significance. Eyebrows have frequently been a reflection of the cultural norms of the time, from the monobrow being a symbol of wisdom in ancient Greece to the thin, nearly non-existent brows of the 1920s. It's noteworthy to note that brow grooming might also have a psychological impact. Studies have found that when people think their eyebrows are well-groomed, they frequently feel more self-assured. Let's take a moment to reflect on the numerous functions that eyebrows provide. I find it to be quite a revelation. These hair arches above our eyes are not merely for aesthetic purposes. They serve a role and a purpose. Their significance is sometimes underrated. One may argue that the brows are our faces' unsung heroes. Let's also take a time to recognize the three components of the brow, skin, hair, and follicles. The nasal bridge and eyelashes are two additional things that aren't. What is the main idea of the lecture? According to the professor, what is a common response to well-groomed eyebrows? How does the professor feel about the importance of eyebrows?
What did the professor mean by? One may argue that the brows are our faces' unsung heroes. Based on the lecture, what can be implied about the cultural significance of eyebrows? Why does the professor mention hair, follicles, skin, eyelashes, and the nose bridge? This part of the test will measure your speaking ability. It will last around 20 to 30 minutes. You will answer four questions. The first question will be about a familiar topic. The other three will be about short conversations, lectures, and reading passages. You can read and hear the lectures and paragraphs only once. You will see the time available for preparing the responses as well as the time to give your response on the bottom side of the screen. You have to stay within those time limits. Speaking Task 1 You will be asked a question about a familiar topic. You will then have 15 seconds to prepare your response, and 45 seconds to speak. Some people prefer to live in the countryside, while others cannot imagine living outside of a city. Which do you prefer and why? Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. Speaking Task 2 You will read a short paragraph and then listen to a conversation between two people. You will have 50 seconds to read the paragraph. After, you will get a question about what you read and heard. You will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. You have 50 seconds to read. Start reading after the beep.
Now listen to the conversation between two people. I know you're a cyclist. You must be excited about these bike lanes. You can bet I am. I am really excited about them. I think it's just the thing that this campus needed. So you think they were necessary? Well, I wouldn't say that they were necessary from the safety standpoint. I was never afraid of cars when I was on my bicycle. The drivers are quite careful and they drive slowly. Yeah, that's true. There's no need to rush when you drive your car on campus. Everything is close by. But the funny thing is, more students will join because they perceive it to be safer and not because they want to join in on the greening of the campus. What do you mean? Even though cycling is safe on campus, people that don't ride bicycles think it's not safe and they are afraid to try it. Now with these bike lanes, they will feel comfortable to try cycling out. Who knows? Maybe I'll just give it a try as well. I have an old bicycle just for you. What does the female student think about the bike lanes? Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. Speaking Task 3 You will read a short paragraph about an academic topic then listen to a lecture about it. You will have 50 seconds to read the paragraph. After, you will get a question about what you read and heard. You will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. You have 50 seconds to read. Start reading after the beep. Now listen to the lecture. We can distinguish two forms of ecological succession. Primary succession occurs in places where previously there was no obvious sign of life. Let's imagine an earthquake that submerges a beach. Now let's imagine that previously that beach was devoid of life. Let's say that it was part of a desert. But now when it's submerged, it's teeming with life, with small microorganisms or other marine life. 
Primary succession is characterized by species arriving and making their home in a place that was a home to nobody before. Secondary succession, however, is not that peaceful. It's best to describe secondary succession. We can give you the common example of weeds growing on our lawn. Now our beautiful green lawn becomes infested with an invasive species that is slowly removing the grass that is native to it. If something isn't done, the weeds will completely replace the grass that was there before. I hope that this example makes it clear to you what secondary succession entails. A complete change of management, so to speak, where one species gets completely supplanted by another. What types of ecological succession does the professor mention in the lecture? Use points and examples from the lecture. Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. You will listen to a lecture about an academic topic. After, you will get a question about what you heard. You will have 20 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. Now listen to the lecture. Figurative art is one of the oldest forms of art there is. It consists of work that represents humans and other forms of nature. It is one of the most enduring styles of art. Many leaders and cultural movements have used figurative art to make statements. Many things that are really important to us, many things to which we assign great value, we would be surprised to find out that they are parts of figurative art. We can also talk about figurative art by looking into its forms. Here we can talk about realism, expressionism, surrealism. Expressionism is focused on the emotions. This is achieved by, for example, presenting humans in uncomfortable body postures with exaggerated facial expressions. The purpose of showing that is that the person is feeling a certain way and they're feeling it intensely. Surrealism is a form in which, as you can guess from the name, deals with the outworldly. Its main feature are representations that come straight out of a dream. One might say that we are seeing a projection of somebody's subconscious mind. Similar to expressionism, we can see the human form being contorted in strange ways. But unlike surrealism, here the intent isn't to put an emphasis on a feeling. Rather, the intention is to show something supernatural. What forms of figurative art are mentioned in the lecture? Include points and examples from the lecture. Prepare your response after the beep.
Start speaking after the beep. This part of the test will measure your writing ability in an academic environment. It will last around 30 minutes. You will write two responses. In the first task, which is called an integrated question, you will read a passage and then listen to a lecture. After that, you will answer a question based on what you read and heard. In the second task, which is called an academic discussion question, a professor will ask a question that you need to answer. Writing Task 1, Integrated Question. For this task, you will read a passage, and then hear a lecture about an academic topic. You will have three minutes to read the passage. You may take notes during the reading and the listening. The reading passage will be shown again, during the time when you are supposed to write, but you will listen to the lecture only once. You will have 20 minutes to write your response. Effective responses are usually between 150 to 225 words. You have three minutes to read. Start reading now.
Now listen to the lecture. Today we are here to unravel some prevalent misconceptions regarding the impact of e-commerce on traditional retail. A widely held belief is that e-commerce has heightened competition, changed consumer behavior, and forced traditional retailers to modify their supply chain and inventory management processes. However, contrary to popular belief, traditional retail still has a significant role to play and continues to thrive in its own unique way. Let's first address the assumption about increased competition due to e-commerce. This may seem true on the surface, but the heart of retail competition remains grounded in real-world dynamics. While e-commerce has expanded the market, local brick-and-mortar stores still cater to immediate needs and specific demographics. Their tangible presence, coupled with personalized human interaction, continues to offer a competitive edge that online platforms can't fully replicate. The unique charm and experience offered by these stores foster a loyal customer base, which is not easily swayed by online alternatives. The perceived shift in consumer behavior is also not as widespread as often stated. While e-commerce provides convenience, many consumers continue to appreciate the sensory experience of in-store shopping. Tactile feedback, immediate possession, and the joy of an outing are factors that online shopping can't replace. Plus, there is a significant proportion of the population, particularly among older generations, who are not as comfortable with technology and prefer traditional shopping methods. Lastly, the belief that e-commerce has pressurized traditional retailers into revamping their supply chains might be overstated. Many brick-and-mortar stores are actually benefiting from the buy-online, pick-up-in-store, BOPIS model, turning their physical locations into effective distribution points. This model caters to the demand for instant gratification and allows for better inventory control. Thus, contrary to popular belief, e-commerce can complement rather than undermine traditional retail practices. Summarize the points made in the lecture, being sure to explain how they cast doubt on specific points made in the reading passage. You have 20 minutes to write. Start writing now.
In this task, you will need to answer a question posed by a professor. You will also be able to see how two other students answered it. You will have 10 minutes to write your response. Effective responses will have at least 100 words.
If you find these videos helpful, you can come and support us on Patreon. You can gain access to ad-free content as well as more tests. Your support is appreciated.